Shaders are always a hot topic, and the term is used almost universally when discussing graphic processing. While they're already a ubiquitous tool in every game developer's arsenal, the technology behind them is constantly evolving. Two very interesting new shader types have been introduced, mesh shaders and amplification shaders. But to understand what they are, we're going to have to do a quick overview of what shaders are and why you'd want to use them. Then we'll focus on what these two new shader types bring to the party. A special thanks to subscriber Penhalian Wolf for the suggestion. So let's get started. In this first section, we'll explain what a shader is and why you'd want to write one. So if you're already comfortable with answering those questions, feel free to skip ahead to the next chapter marker. Let's start with a basic problem statement. We would like to draw a 3D cube on the screen. There are many ways to accomplish this, of course, but suppose we start by defining a cube as a mesh. A mesh is a collection of vertices in three-dimensional space, and n-gons defined as a series of edges connecting those vertices. And unless you're a 3DO developer, those n-gons will probably be triangles. Now let's build that theoretical mesh as a set of eight vertices, centered around the origin, and with a length of two units per edge. Okay, that's a fine cube. Next, suppose we wanted to display our cube on a monitor. Well, here we will hand wave and skip a bit for the moment to make a point. You see, these coordinates of negative 1 and plus 1 mean nothing to your monitor's coordinate system. So we would need some way to project them onto that flat surface. Transforming vertices has always been the job of matrices, so we could create a projection matrix that could be multiplied by each vertex to map it into the monitor's coordinate system. Pretty cool, right? Let's now take that opportunity to jump back a step and skip a bit less. What if we wanted to take that mesh and rotate it and move it? We could, of course, use matrix math to rotate those vertices around, and that would work. But now what if you wanted two cube instances? Well, this is getting all too confusing. To address this, let's talk about coordinate systems. Let's call the coordinate system we used in defining the mesh a local coordinate system and the one that we will eventually project onto the screen, the world coordinate system. Now for each cube in the mesh instance, we can use a specific transformation matrix to transform its vertices into the correct position and orientation in world space. So at a high level, we've managed to transform our mesh instances into world space and project those world space coordinate based meshes onto the screen. With just this, we can display many kinds of meshes and have them all show up on the screen in different places and orientations. Very cool first step. But now let's fill in one of the skip steps. You see, vertices themselves are infinitely small theoretical points in three-dimensional space that is also theoretical. They don't have an actual appearance. We drew lines here for display purposes, but in reality, Appearances are whatever we decide they are. So let's figure out how to take this set of triangles already transformed into screen space and give them an appearance by rasterizing them. Effectively filling in the area they define with screen pixels. Now imagine this first triangle as being simply red. We could effectively fill in that area because we know what each pixel should look like. It should be red. In most games, of course, there will be a texture applied to it by pinning mesh vertices to texture coordinates. The texture would then be applied using interpolation between the pins. But for now, congratulations! We can now go from a simple cube, defined by coordinates in local space, transform it into world space, project that onto a 2D surface like a monitor, and finally rasterize it so that we give it its appearance. We have defined a very basic render pipeline. And for the longest time, this pipeline was fixed and tied tightly to your graphics library, OpenGL for example. I mean, it was really the only game in town. If you used an early OpenGL API, you could just tell it about your meshes, components, your transform and projection matrices, and kind of rough information about lighting and how to rasterize each polygon, then tell it to get to work. 
And it did work great, but people demanded more. So what if we didn't want to just perform simple transformation into world space? And what if we wanted to change the color of each rasterized pixel based on light information, surface normals, or something arbitrary like world space distance from the viewer? Enter shader programs. By writing our own shader programs, we can replace parts of that fixed pipeline and define, in code, what happens in those different phases. And we already know about two of the most famous ones, the vertex shader and the fragment shader. A vertex shader redefines the default way vertices gets transformed into world space and screen space, and your fragment shader can redefine what the resultant color of each pixel in each polygon should look like. And you can base it on whatever you want to base it on. You want to create your own multi-texturing or perform your own per-pixel lighting calculations? Your fragment shaders are your friend. And to create one, you simply must write the code in the appropriate language for your library, like GLSL or HLSL, and let it compile your shader code into low-level instructions optimized for your card. Then, when you want to use it, you tell DirectX or OpenGL or whoever when you want to use its new behavior instead of a phase's default behavior. Okay, we could easily spend another hundred hours digging into every bit of minutia and what we just discussed, but we won't. We discussed this bit to provide a context to discuss mesh shaders and their partner amplification shaders. You see, the problem with the method we talked about earlier is that you typically send your list of vertices and their related attributes and triangles en masse directly or indirectly into your pipeline. And while this works very well in cases where there aren't that many vertices and n-gons, those buffers can get exceptionally large as the mesh grows to higher and higher complexity. And let's face it, as people demand greater and greater detail, that's where we're heading. Mesh shaders operate on an entire mesh that has been decomposed into chunks called meshlets, typically containing between 32 and 200 vertices each. Your shader can spawn a collection of thread groups, each of which can work on a meshlet in parallel. Each shared vertex in the meshlet, which means a vertex that is shared between multiple n-gons, can be transformed only once for every n-gon that references it. That's a great time saver. Depending on how you define your meshlets, this allows several easy optimizations. For example, what if you group together multiple triangles facing in the same direction? It would be then trivial to call a collection of back-facing faces in one fell swoop. And what if you detected that the bounds of an entire meshlet fell outside of the bounds of your view? Using a simple bounding box test, well, you can call it in the shader as a chunk. Though you're no longer required to iterate a mesh's entire list of vertices and primitives, remember, as we always say on here, the fastest calculation is the one you don't do. Your mesh shader simply then must output transformed vertices and their related attributes just as you would with a vertex shader, but now you'll only output the ones that you really need. This lets you be much more space and processing time efficient in a whole new manner. So what about the optional amplification shaders? They're much simpler to understand, as mesh shaders control thread groups that process meshlets, amplification shaders orchestrate thread groups of mesh shaders. So why would you want to do that? Well, you'd want to use it in any case where you'd want something a higher level than an individual mesh shader. Per instance level culling, uh, tessellation, and more of that can be done at a broader scope level. That would be a way to do it. Between these two shaders, you can pretty much replace all of your shaders before the rasterization phase. I think Microsoft described it as a rethinking of the traditional pipeline, and I think I pretty much agree. Let's look at the final pipeline with these new shaders in place. By introducing these new shader types, we've seen a whole new way to replace a large portion of your processing pipeline with an efficient way to deal with arbitrarily large and complex meshes. Admittedly, we left out a lot of the low-level details and many esoteric concepts that would only bring argument but hopefully you see the value in what we did show and already have some good ideas. So that's a quick, high-level explanation of what shaders are and the concepts behind vertex, fragment, and mesh, and amplification shaders. 
Would you like to use something like this in your project? What kind of things do you plan to use them for? Please leave a comment below and let us know. Also, feel free to add any questions or suggestions. And if you enjoyed this video and would be interested in seeing more, please consider liking it, subscribing, and hitting the notification bell. It would be greatly appreciated and really helps out a lot. Thanks for watching.